Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. At the end of our last lesson, uh, we were looking at the first few verses of chapter 7. Uh, chapter 5 and 6 gave us some of uh, the pitfalls that Solomon, the preacher here, had talked about. He spoke about hasty religion, political recognition, uh, riches, uh, all of the things that he found you know, vanity in. There's still some emptiness. There's still a lack of fulfillment in some of those things. So he gets to the end of chapter 6, and after he has compared... Uh, the rich and the poor, the old, the young, the wise, the foolish. He gets to the end of chapter 6 and verse 11 says, Seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? What's, I mean, which guy's better off in the long run? Um, he says in verse 12, For who knoweth what is good? Chapter 6, verse 12, Who knoweth what is good for man in this life all the days of his life, which he spendeth as a shadow? For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? So chapter 6 closes with a very crusty attitude about life and not being able to tell you what's better. But after a short thought, when chapter 7 opens up, we looked at the first few verses and he was able to tell us that, no, um, there is an approach to life that is better. Wisdom is better than foolishness. Um, if nothing else, even his worldly experiences, his outlook that is under the sun tells him that a serious approach to life is better. I mean, you want to have a good name. Chapter 7 opens with verse 1 telling us that a good name is better than precious ointment. It tells us that it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. It tells us that sorrow is better than laughter. In other words, there, <clears throat> you need to have at least some sense of a serious approach to life. Life is important. Life is short. And, and to just live it frivolously or to live a life that is spent in folly that is certainly no betterment. That is certainly no advantage over um, the pursuit of wisdom. Uh, let's pick up where we left off. Uh, we finished with verse 5 last week. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Verse 6, for as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of a fool. This also is vanity. Number one, wisdom's pursuit. Wisdom's pursuit. He speaks here of the, the crackling of thorns, and he compares that to the laughter of a fool. Now, the crackling of thorns, you would, you would look at that and you would say, see, there's something that's nice and showy, and it's noisy, but it's not productive. You know, when you put thorns into the fire, they may pop, they may make noise, but it's not necessarily a good fuel. It's not going to produce a fire that lasts any length of time. He says, that's the laughter of a fool. That's how a fool is. It's noise without effectiveness. Just like throwing thorns into the fire, you may get just the smallest, um, the smallest bit from it, but there is nothing that's lasting in that. There's nothing that's effective in that. Um, so he continues, he's continuing with the thoughts of how, you know, a life that's just spent in foolishness, I can't say that that's better than a life that's spent pursuing wisdom. Now, laughter is okay. He, he's comparing it here. You know, he mentions in um, verse 3 that sorrow is better than laughter. In verse 6, he says, The crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of a fool. This also is vanity. Listen, laughter is okay. This is the same guy that in the other book, Proverbs, told us that merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Um, you're not intended to take his crusty attitude toward, toward laughter um, and say, well, you know, you should never laugh. Uh, laughter is okay, but foolishness is annoying. You can tell from what he has looked at here when he's talked about the house of mourning in comparison to the house of feasting, sorrow and laughter, the sadness of the countenance, and all of those things. Solomon seems to really take issue with people that cannot look at anything seriously. It's okay to laugh. Um, it's okay to have fun. But you and I have both known folks that you know, you look at them and you look at a person, you say, you know, this person's good for a laugh, but they never really contribute much by way of serious input. Uh, I would never go to this person for any real advice or real thoughts of seriousness on life. The only thing that they're good for is maybe a good joke or a good laugh here and there. And Solomon says, that's just, that's vanity. That's foolishness to have 
that approach toward life, that I'm never going to go to the house of mourning, that I'm never going to deal with sorrow, that I'm going to just spend my life in laughter and avoid all approaches to serious things. Um, that, that seems to be what he has a problem with here. Verse 7, he says, that surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. If you stray from an honest and serious approach to life, you're going to have problems. He mentions um, that oppression, as it exists, you know, it, it certainly exists uh, everywhere from what Solomon had been able to see. And a gift destroyeth the heart. We talked about that the other night when we were talking about Micah. We were talking about bribery. We were talking about the Old Testament commands not to take gifts as far as, you know, someone who is a judge, someone who is a prince, the gift being that which would pervert justice. And, and Solomon is able to see here that if, if men don't take a serious and honest approach to life, that is going to lend itself to trouble. In verse 80 says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Again, that's a generality, right? But you and I both know that there is a satisfaction in achieving something, isn't there? You know, when you start a project and... and um, you know, at work, I work on projects. I don't usually work on things that are day or too long. We have projects that are generally six to seven months in length. And when you're at the beginning and things are moving slow and, and, and there's not too much yet that's complicated because you're just really getting started, you know, the project is really kind of easy. But when you get into it and you get a couple of months into it and you start running into issues and you start running into things that need to be fixed and you start getting into the minute details uh, of every little thing in your project, it's hard work and you have to focus. You have to be dedicated. It's not as fun. It's not as easy as it was maybe at the beginning. But at the end, you're able to look at the project when it's completed and there is a satisfaction in having it done. That hard work, that focus, that dedication to the project yields a good result. When you're finished with a project and you can look back on it with success, that's a great feeling. He says here, better is the end of a thing than the beginning of, uh, than the beginning thereof. Again, this is just talking about that, that focus, that serious approach to life. It's good to try and accomplish things. You know, just to never have any goals, to never have any desires, to never have any ambition to finish anything. Solomon's like, that's not the better life. That, that's not, that, he's, that, that's empty too. That's vain too. Um, but better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. So have some diligence, work hard, see things through to fulfillment. And that approach to life is better, he says here, than the opposite. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Uh, patience is compared here as superior to pride. It is better to be disciplined than to be one who can't be told anything. You know, someone who's always lifted up in pride, someone that can't take instruction, someone that can't take criticism. He mentioned earlier in this passage um, about being able to hear the rebuke of the wise. Brother John preached recently uh, about correction and about the wounds of a friend and those things. Being able to hear, to have disciplines about yourself, he says that's better than pride. So at the end, again, we're, we're, we're comparing all things here to the crusty attitude that he had at the end of chapter 6 where he just thought, well, I don't even know what to tell you anymore. I've seen it all, everything. I've seen everything laid out in front of me. I can't even tell you which path is better. And then just in some strict sense, he's like, no, there are some things that are better. A serious approach to life, uh, a good name, a good testimony, um, hard work, diligence, the, be, the being able to see things through to a completion, um, patience, disciplines, better certainly than pride. Another thing he says in verse 9, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Don't be quick to be angry. And that seems like that's something we've heard before because that's a running theme uh, in other passages of Scripture, right? 
Um, one of the qualifications for a minister is that he's not soon angry. Uh, the ability to be angry and not couple it with sin, right? The passage that says, be ye angry and sin not. I've always found that easier to quote than to practice because somehow I mix those two together frequently and regularly. But he says here that that the anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Uh, it's, uh, it's silly for a person to feed and to nurse anger, hostility, bitterness, grudges. He says that stuff rests in the bosom of fools. So um, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. Uh, lack of self-control shows and displays a weakness of character. McDonald said that you can judge the size of a man by the size of what it takes for him to lose his temper. And, and that's, uh, I think that's a good way of putting, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. Another foolish activity in verse number 10, say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Another foolish activity Another way to say, you know what, it's not, really, it's not really beneficial to look at life this way is to always be looking at the past. You don't want to be somebody that just lives in the past and always talks about, oh, man, the, the good old days. You know, if, if you're reading Ecclesiastes, and we're talking about 3,000 years ago, Solomon is not very happy by what he's seeing around him. Um, and he says, why, why would you say that? Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? It's a fool's errand, right, to, to live in the past. Even if the old days were better, that's not reality now, right? Um, it's wasted time to wish those things, to, to always focus on the past. You and I live in the here and now. Our encouragement and challenge is to work to overcome the circumstances of life, to be faithful, to be diligent, and the cause that we have in the here and now. It's the foolish person, as it said, that would rather curse the darkness than light one little candle. Um, don't, don't always focus on the past. If you are consumed with a life spent focused on all of the things that are gone by and, and a wish to return to all those things, Solomon's like, that's, that's silly. That's not reality. So that, don't let that be the focus either. And that's where we'll close point number one in just looking, if you compare, if you take um, chapter 7, verse 1, down through verse number 10, he is telling us some things that he's saying, you know what, there is an approach that I think is better. Now, obviously, he is speaking about, he is taking his view under the sun. He's not taking his, um, his influence from the law. He's not taking his influence from the scripture. He's taking his influence from what he is seeing around him, from what he is experiencing with an outlook under the sun. And yet he's like, even in that, I think these approaches to life are better. Okay. Wisdom is better. Seriousness is better. That, that any laughter really needs to be laughter and frivolity really needs to be, um, tempered with a serious approach to life. Don't spend your time living in the past. Have self-disciplines. Um, practical things, okay? You could poke holes in any of these, and you can uplift any of these because, again, his outlook, his perspective is that which is taken under the sun. But this is his conclusion, that I, I think this way is better. All right, number two, wisdom's comparison. In verse number 11, he says, Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. Now, when you think about an inheritance, what do we usually think about? What do we think about money? We think about um, material things being an inheritance. And Solomon says that wisdom is good with an You want to you lay something side by side. You think money is good. You think an inheritance is good. Wait till you hear about wisdom. Now it says in verse number 11, by it there is profit to them that see the sun. These things, you know, wisdom like money is only going to help you, you know, in the here and now, you know, in, in this life to put these things into practice, to see them, to do them. For wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. You know, this comparison of, of, of wisdom to money 
is multiple fold here. You know, just like money only do you good in the here and now, wisdom is going to do you good. It's for those that live to see the sun. Money is a defense, right? Money's, money's helpful. Um, money can help you with, um, money can protect you from material loss, physical things. But wisdom resembles money and that they both provide protection and security, right? Just like money can protect you or inheritance can protect you and provide security financially in material things, wisdom provides security and protection in life and spiritual things. Notice what he says in verse 12, for wisdom is a defense and money is a defense, but the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Wisdom will do more for you than money will do for you. Now, wisdom won't put, <laughs> you know, wisdom won't put food on the table, right? You actually have to work. You have to earn a living. You do have to earn money. You do have to work to provide. That's not what he's talking about. Wisdom will go beyond those things that you see that you find in the use for money. Money will provide things for you. Money will provide the material for you. But wisdom will provide all that more, all that much more for you in, in the realm of spiritual things, in the realm of um, you know, disciplines and obedience. The excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. There are some things that you cannot buy, right? You remember back in verse number one where he talks about a good name being better than precious ointment? You can buy precious ointment if you have enough money. You cannot buy a good reputation. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter um, <laughs> how much you think you could pay for it. There are some things that money can't buy. And therefore, he talks about the excellency of, of wisdom, even in this comparison that he is making. Wisdom is better. Wisdom can give life. Money might protect you from financial or material damage, but wisdom can protect you from moral and spiritual damage. You know, it's interesting, later you come to the New Testament, and Paul, when he writes, he speaks about Jesus Christ as what? The wisdom of God. Those that find Jesus Christ find life. Just, just as he speaks here of those that have wisdom and the life that it is able to provide for them. Now look at verse 13. Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight, which he hath made crooked. One thing that a wise person will consider is that God is sovereign over the affairs of life. Right? That, that's something that the wise person takes into account. The foolish person doesn't. The foolish person does often see, and we see it in our world today, uh, the foolish person doesn't take God into account at all, right? That everything's random, everything is by chance. And he says that, that the wise would consider the work of God, that God is involved, that God sovereignly oversees all of the affairs of life. In doing so, verse 14, in the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider God also has set the one over the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. In ordering our lives and in telling us in verse 13 that God has sovereign control over all of those affairs and that when he makes something straight, it can't be crooked, that, that God um, orders events. God has seen fit to give us times of prosperity and times of adversity. And he has advice for both of those, right? If, if you are currently in a state of prosperity, enjoy that, right? In verse 14, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. If things are good in your life right now, be thankful, be grateful. If you're in a spot in life where um, you feel, you know, a good deal of blessing, whether that be material or spiritual or moral or, or whatever it may be, if you feel that, like in times of prosperity, be grateful for that. Enjoy that. Be thankful that God has provided, that God is working in your life, that um, there's nothing wrong with that. Enjoy those things. But in the day of adversity, consider if you perhaps are in a time of adversity, there is time of trial, there's time of struggle 
the preacher here says to consider it. What do you mean consider it? Well, in verse number 13, he spoke of the work of God, how God sovereignly oversees all the affairs of life. If there's prosperity in life, certainly enjoy it. If there's adversity, if there's struggle, keep in mind that God sends both the good and the bad. And he does this so that it causes us to live by faith. Notice what it says at the end of verse 14. God also has set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. Guess what's going to happen tomorrow? You're as clueless about it as I am, right? You have no idea if tomorrow for you is a day of prosperity or if it's going to be a day of adversity. Uh, we live life knowing that God sovereignly and in his will, he oversees all of those things. He sends both prosperity and adversity. And there is no way for us to know today which one of those things could be in our lap tomorrow. Therefore, we are, we are prodded to live by faith and to trust. You and I both know that in days of prosperity, that, that we be grateful, we enjoy those things, we rejoice, and yet we don't assume that those days are endless, right? We, all, we understand that the trial of our faith that, that works all of those character things uh, is coming, that trial and adversity and struggle, that, that's reality, that's part of it, that those days are coming. And therefore, even in days of prosperity, we live by faith. We trust the Lord because we don't know what is after us. We don't know what's coming next. In those days of adversity, we are certainly prodded to live by faith. Christ is the one that is going to see us through to give us the ability and the strength to overcome, to live through the adversity that lays before us. No matter which path we are on in life, whether it be prosperity or adversity, we have no clue what's, what is next. Okay, um, The rich man... And the poor man, neither one of them are any more secure in tomorrow than the other one is. Um, so wisdom tells you to be thoughtful, to be considerate, to enjoy the prosperity while it is there. And when the adversity comes, take note um, that the same God that sends prosperity allows adversity to come in. Um, it's not good for a man to get too set without faith. Um, when, we start, when we start to look forward and feel confident in what tomorrow will bring, that eases our faith. In other words, if you and I know what would happen tomorrow, you and I would not have nearly as much faith today as we ought to. If you and I knew that prosperity was coming tomorrow, um, we would not take today as seriously uh, as we should. If we knew that tomorrow was going to bring adversity, you and I would start worrying and, and uh, agonizing over it today instead of enjoying, enjoying the prosperity that is today. Um, don't, don't neglect to consider and to keep in mind that the one that brings adversity is the same one that brings prosperity. And God works those things so that we never know what's going to happen tomorrow. And that prods our faith. All right, number three, the puzzle of worldly philosophy. Now, all of these things have been taken with a view under the sun. And you and I have seen through the book of Ecclesiastes that Solomon sometimes comes to conclusions that you would not come to if you had a spiritual outlook. If you had a look over the sun, or if you had a look that was influenced by godly wisdom, that was influenced by the entirety of scriptures, you don't always come to the same conclusions. Chapter 7, verse 15 through uh, 18 is one of these times. Now I'm going to read this here, and notice in verse 15, all, these, all things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. 
Now, these, again, these verses were reminded of the harsh reality of man's reasonings. Um, under the sun, Solomon is trying to find a fixed connection between righteousness and blessing and sin and punishment, right? That, that, that is just the view that he's trying to take. I'm trying to find a connection that pursuing wisdom will inevitably lead to this direction. Pursuing folly will lead to this direction, right? Now, what would you assume, if, if that is your assumption, if you're saying that righteousness and wisdom blessing, lead to blessing, sin and folly lead to judgment or punishment, what is one of the first things that you would assume? You would assume that those that are wise, those that are righteous, would what? Would live longer lives than those that are foolish, sinful. But notice what he has found. In verse 15, he says, There is a just man that perisheth, is, perisheth in his righteousness. There is a wicked man that prolongeth, prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Now, that totally goes against everything that Solomon is trying to connect under the sun. He's trying to tell you that wisdom is the right path, right? That, we, you know, of all the things I've seen, I still think that this is the path you ought to be on. And yet he's now telling you, that, but, but I've seen people on this path and, and they die at a young age or they perish in their righteousness. And here I've spent all these verses telling you to avoid folly. And yet I've seen people live in folly and live in sinfulness and they just go on long lives as happily as they could possibly seem. That seems to counteract or to contradict all the things he's telling you it's worthwhile to pursue. You know, man, I'm telling you that the, the, the way to a good and happy and long life is to pursue wisdom. And yet that's not a guarantee of long life, is it? That the pursuit of wisdom is not a guarantee that everything's going to be okay. And that you'll live happily ever after. Because I've seen that a just man perishes in his righteousness. And that a wicked man prolongs his life in his wickedness. Now because he has seen that, he's going to come to a rotten conclusion. Okay, Verse 16, be not righteous over much. Neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Be not over much wicked. Neither be thou foolish, why shouldest thou die before thy time? Here's the conclusion. Okay, you have to read 16 and 17 together. You would assume that righteousness and wisdom and all those good pursuits would lead this way, that sinfulness, wickedness, folly would lead this way, and yet sometimes those paths cross. And yet sometimes the righteous people are unhappy and the wicked people are happy. And sometimes the righteous die before their time and the wicked seem to live an extraordinarily long life. I, Solomon's conclusion under the sun is this. Well, then it's probably best to just hang out middle of the road. Don't be overly righteous. Don't be overly wicked. Don't be overly wise. Don't be overly foolish. Moderation, right? This is kind of the puzzle of worldly wisdom. Uh, I have a center column reference here as I, I have a Schofield Bible, and he says, natural wisdom, be moderately religious and moderately wicked. That is what a view under the sun, as he has tried to connect everything, he can't come to a solid, good conclusion. We just read the first part of chapter 7, and it's like he's on a roll, right? It's like he's found the right way. It's like he's found all the things that he ought to pursue in wisdom, and in all the things that he assumed would be the outcome didn't work out that way. And I find the righteous dying before his time, and I find the wicked living long and happy lives. Maybe it's just to just be middle of the road. And don't be overly righteous, and don't be overly wicked, don't be overly wise or overly foolish. Verse 18, it is good that thou shouldest take hold of this, yea, also from this Withdraw not thy hand, for he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. In other words, he had found a virtue in walking down the middle. He, he convinced himself that it was virtuous to just walk right down the middle. 
moderation, right? Be moderately religious. But, it, you know, he's not, <laughs> this is not the outlook of someone that is looking at heaven. This is not the outlook of someone that is looking um, with a godly influence. This is someone who is trying to connect his experiences and what he has seen to the best way to live life. And now he's struggling because he can't put anything together. So I'm just going to walk the middle of the road, he said. I think it'll be virtuous. I think it's best. I think that'll be better than either of the extremes. Don't sell out to righteousness. Don't sell out to wickedness. Find somewhere in the middle of the road. And I think maybe there's where you'll be most happy. Now, I will tell you, and I would tell you from the, from the fullness of Scripture, you go ahead and sell out to righteousness. Don't give place to Eve. Don't give place to anything that's wicked, right? Don't give place to the devil at all, it says. Now, he's saying, be not over much. Don't, don't be righteous over much, and don't be wicked over much. You know, mingle the two, mix the two together. Um, if your experiences are teaching you that, you need to find a different influence. This is the problem with worldly wisdom. These verses teach us what happens when you take your view of life based on the things that you see around you? This world has a lot of weird views. Um, this is one of them. Solomon is under a strange influence here as he is trying to interpret life based on the connections he's made in seeing other people's lives. I've seen the righteous die young, so maybe you shouldn't be overly righteous. I've seen the wicked live long and happy lives, but I know it's not right to be wicked. But maybe if you just mingle the two and mix them together and walk the middle of the road, maybe that's where you'll find the best virtue. That is not actually the correct approach, but it is wisdom that exists under the sun. Now, I'm going to close with the rest of this chapter, and we'll try to get through it as quickly as we can here. But... The rest of these verses tell you maybe how he has come to this conclusion because Solomon's about done with people. Um, I, I put the, gave Cece the title for the lesson uh, as more wisdom, less people. Because number four, we're going to deal with the disappointment of people. Um, in verse number 19, wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which were in the city. Uh, Solomon believed wisdom gave sh more strength and protection than ten mighty men could give a city. I don't think that that's necessarily wrong. But notice what he says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Now, the four at the beginning of verse 20 means that you connect it, right? Wisdom, wisdom is needed because nobody's righteous. There's actually... We, we understand that, right? We understand the universality of sin. But he even says here, there's not a just man on earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And actually, wisdom really is needed because we do need to recognize that none of us are righteous. A sense of our own imperfection um, teaches us that wisdom is important. Verse, verse 21, also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. Again, a sense of our own inability, our own weakness, a sense of our own imperfection will give us the ability to take criticism in a different way. He's able to say here that we don't have to worry, you don't have to take heed to all the words that are spoken, even if a servant curse thee. You know, you're reminded of the story back from 2 Samuel where um, David had been cursed, right? Was it Shimei? Shimei had cursed David, and Abishai was ready to go. He's like, let me just cut his head off. And David's like, no, you know what? There's probably a good reason for it. And David took a cursing from someone far, far beneath him because um, he was able to see potentially God's hand in it. And Solomon's saying the same thing here. Wisdom is needed because, you know, obviously we, we have a sense of our own imperfection. Keeping that wisdom, keeping that understanding of our own imperfection, we're able to take critique, criticism from others. Listen, anytime that you say anything bad against me, um, you're right. 
I, I, am, I am all of the things that you think I am and worse. We're sinners. We, we can never fully describe or understand um, the, the depths that's in our hearts. Verse 22, for oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise has cursed others. You, you know, live with wisdom. Keep, keep an understanding of yourself. You start to realize that we're often guilty of the same things that frustrate us and others, aren't we? Uh, it's easy to set expectations for people that we don't always meet ourselves. You know, if I read to you verse 21 and said, Take no heed all the words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. You know what? If somebody curses you, shrug it off. Don't think about it. Don't worry about it. You're like, no, man, they, people done me wrong. This guy over here cursed me. He said something mean. He said something bad about me. And he says in verse number 22, for oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise has cursed others. Really? You never mumbled something under your breath about someone? You know, you never talked about somebody behind their back? Wisdom teaches us different. Uh, verse 23, all this have I proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. Solomon used his wisdom to explore all the areas of life. He wanted to be wise enough to solve all mysteries, but making these investigations under the sun, making these investigations just by looking at the examples around him, the answers eluded him, right? I tried, I proved it, tried to prove by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. And that which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Life is plagued by mysteries and things unknown. If you do not impart divine revelation, <laughs> this world is plagued by mysteries. This world um, has not nearly the answers that we have when we have the foundation of scripture. So I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things, to know the wickedness of folly, even the foolishness and madness. In spite of his failure, he persevered in this pursuit. He wants to know how, why, how can people continue to live in, fully, or in folly and foolishness and madness? And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Whoso pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. I suppose if anyone was qualified to teach about um, what women could do to you, Solomon would have been qualified. Um, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. The Bible tells us that these um, wives that he had served and worshipped other gods and actually were an influence in causing him to do the same. Um, Solomon has found um, that women were a trouble to him. Behold, verse 27, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. I, I wanted to find, I counted, I looked, and I diligently searched one by one. Verse 28, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. You know what Solomon has found? People will disappoint you. And if you are trying to make your pursuit of wisdom or your understanding of this world based on the people that are around you, and the experiences that you share with them and what you see in their lives, you're going to come up disappointed. You know why? Because I found that there's not a just man on earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And I found that the one that gets mad at the cursor is the one that curses in his own heart. And I love women. Solomon had a thousand women at least, um, but they gave him trouble. And yet I tried to count one by one the people that had a strict and real influence. People in verse number 27, behold this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. And what did he find? Maybe one man in a thousand? Solomon 
is disappointed with people. He's become disillusioned by looking at people. And that's how we're going to close because that, that is reality. If you are going to make your determinations of wisdom and how to pursue life and how to live and you try to find the best route just by watching people, you're going to find yourself ultimately disappointed. Um, listen, if you look at me, I'm going to disappoint you. You know, I, I'm not the best husband. I am not the best dad. I'm not the best teacher. I'm not the best employee. I, I have faults, failures, and sinful ways in everything that I try to pursue. I, I, I am what I am. As, as a man, I am a sinner. I am full of um, disappointment. Don't look at me <laughs> as the way, as the as your model in the pursuit of wisdom. You go beyond me. You go beyond any of us here. You find that which the scripture has determined is right and what is wise. Because if you just start people watching, Solomon is crusty. Solomon has gotten to a point in this chapter now where he's basically said, maybe it's just best to live in the middle of the road. Don't sell out one way or another. Just... Don't be too wise. Don't be too foolish. Don't be too righteous. Don't be too wicked. Just find somewhere in the middle. Stay in your lane. Try to find some means of happiness. And he's looking around at people and he cannot find his answer. Okay. Uh, that's the way it is. If you just look at people, you probably find yourself more disappointed than you ought to be. Um, let the scriptures be our foundation of wisdom and the life that we would want to pursue. Uh, Solomon is telling us, I've looked and I've experienced a lot. And he's clueless. At the end of chapter 7, he's just clueless. He doesn't know what to tell you. All right? People. More wisdom, less people. All right? Father, we're thankful to come today. We are um, thankful to be in, our, in, a, in your house.